So open your Bible to the book of Jude. I want to talk to you a little bit this morning about prayer. And uh, I want to just park in the book of Jude for a minute. And then I want to tell you three enemies to your prayer life. And then I want to give you a prescription to help you develop a better, uh, a better prayer life. Um, we are living in a time of apostasy, of falling away from the faith. Do you understand what I mean by that? Uh, we are clearly in what could be called post-Christian America. We're no longer the high ground of the universities, the high ground of, of government in many places, the high ground of, of the centers that influence and move our culture along. Media, uh, for example, et cetera, are non-Christian. In many cases, they are anti-Christian. Our last president told us this is no longer a Christian nation. And he went on to say this is a nation of many faiths, and he named those faiths. He's absolutely right. This is no longer, in that sense, a Christian nation. It is a Buddhist nation, a Muslim nation, and so forth. We still say in God we trust, but the principles of, of biblical Christianity are not widely accepted. Our current president, God bless his heart, there's a Bible study that goes on by Ralph Trollinger, a former NBA star, that involves half the cabinet right off the, right off the Oval Office. Mike Pence, uh, our vice president, pops into that uh, on occasion. And, and, and Mr. Trump gets the, um, gets the notes from that Bible study. His uh, uh, mother is related to the wonderful folks that were a part of the great Hebrides revival in 1948-49. And that was one of the Bibles he took to the podium. He has, he has a, a, um, a godly Christian heritage. In fact, a revival, a revival heritage on his mother's side of the family. But if you listen to him and his language and the scandals that he's involved in, you realize this man needs to know Jesus. He needs a relationship with the Lord. We are in trouble. The good guys are the bad guys. The bad guys are the good guys. What used to be moral, if you state it, if you believe it, if you stand for it, you can lose your business, your job. What used to be immoral is now legal. Everything is upside down. And here's the problem. When you have this kind of context in the culture, it creates apostasy in the church. When you have moral freefall in the culture, all of a sudden, the lines are being drawn in different ways. And to protect ourselves, we go silent. We hedge on our beliefs. We, 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 we're duplicitous. We, we, we're, well, I won't be as bold as about that, about that. So when you have this kind of thing happening in the culture, you have apostasy or defection from the faith, but you don't recognize it that way. You don't see it that way. And, and so the new normal in other times would be a terribly low spiritual benchmark for us. If you accept what is normal now among Christianity, you have accepted a terribly low spiritual benchmark. And it is precisely this that Jude warns against. Now Jude, if you don't know this, is a brother of Jesus. And he writes this book just before he dies. Now Father, help me communicate this in a clear, compelling an even convicting way, I ask in Jesus' name. Jude says, verse three, I found it necessary to write to you to exhort you to earnestly fight for the faith. Not faith, but the faith. Now, the faith is a set of propositional truths that at the very center of your faith, it's not the truth that makes a Presbyterian a Presbyterian or a Pentecostal a Pentecostal. It's the truth 
at the center, the core of Christianity that makes a Christian a Christian. Now he said, the problem is that there are certain men that have crept in into the church and they are ungodly. That is, their ungodly influences, not from the outside, they're now working on the inside. Now, obviously, they're not in this church. They're in the church right down the street. Aren't you glad you're here this morning? They're all around us, these ungodly influences, and they are coming from this side of the line. Well, what are, what are they doing? Well, number one, they turn the grace of God into lewdness. And... They deny the only Lord God. Two very simple things. Number one, the first area of compromise is that grace is set forth in such an extraordinary and positive and high, almost idolatrous way that the narrative of the church becomes this. It doesn't matter that you don't live a godly life. Grace will take care of everything. It doesn't matter how you live. God loves you. God forgives you. God cares about you. Your lifestyle really doesn't matter. They turn the grace of God into an opportunity or an occasion to live a life that's less than godly. Now, we're not talking about legalism here. You understand that? You're saved by what? By grace, but you're saved not by static grace, but a dynamic grace. You, 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 don't, you don't do this or that or not do this and that in order to, to be saved or even to keep your salvation. You are saved by grace and you're kept by grace. But if grace has a grip on you, then it begins to change your life in profound ways so that your language, your habits, your wants, your desires, your likes, everything is radically changed. Barna says on 131, 132 measurements, there's no difference between us and the pagans who live around us. My dear brothers and sisters, this is apostasy. This is a church that's been influenced by the moral freefall of the culture around it. And we don't even realize how far away from God we've grown, how far we've fallen. Like the frog in the kettle, when the temperature is gradually heated up over a 50-year period, 60-year period, like it has in America, we don't realize the immoral changes around us and we assimilate the change and we don't hop out of the kettle. The second thing that Jude said you have to be concerned about is a culture that tells you that Jesus is not the only way of salvation. They deny the only Lord God. They deny the exclusiveness of, of Christ. So Jesus sits in the pantheon right alongside Mohammed and Buddha and everybody else. Choose your flavor. That's all. All religions are the same. All reli no, all religions are not the same. And all saviors are not the same. There is a world of difference between the warrior Mohammed and the peacemaker Jesus who turned the other cheek and went to the cross. There is a world of difference between the two. And so Jude says, I'm worried about you. And I want to remind you that God delivered a group of people out of Egypt and they died in the, in the wilderness. I want to remind you that there were angels once around the throne of God in heaven and now they're in hell. I want to remind you that whole cities have perished because of unchecked immorality. I, I, I want to warn you against uh, the influence that defiles the flesh and, and, and rejects authority and speaks evil of dignitaries. I, I want to warn you about going in the way of Cain. What did he do? He made up his own rules for worship. We say it all the time. Worship in your own way. It's not biblical at all. God has prescribed the way to worship. See, Cain thought he could make up his own rules for coming to God. You can't make up your own rules. Why? There's one way. Because God wants to break the back of my rebellion. He wants to break the back of my independence. He wants to bring me to a place where I trust not me and my judgment, but I trust him and his judgment alone. The second thing he said, Warren, is that they've gone the way of Balaam. What did he do? He used religion for his own profit. He thought that he could prophesy and get a benefit out of it. 
I want to warn you, don't follow the era of Korah. He couldn't stay in his office. He rebelled against, uh, against Moses. These are sensual people who cause divisions and they don't have the spirit. Now, what do you do when you're overwhelmed by this kind of stuff? I mean, this is overwhelming, isn't it? I mean, this is just in your face. I didn't want to preach this message. I had a happy message, but I had notes delivered from your pastor who said, I'd rather not preach this. You're leaving town anyway, so why don't you preach this message this morning? He's really not as nice as you think he is. Is, is, is he right? I'm telling you. Now, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not telling you the truth here. What do you do? I want to show you something. I want to show you something at the end of Jude. I want to show you verse 20, but you, beloved, build yourself up on your most holy faith. Now, here's what Jude is saying. In a time of cultural, moral freefall and apostasy in the church, you cannot leave it to the pastor or the church or anybody else. You have to take responsibility for your own soul health. You have to watch out for yourself. You, 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 you have to say, Lord, I don't want to be deceived by all the stuff going on in the culture. I want to know what you want me to believe and you want how you want me to live. So Jude said, you have to take responsibility for your own spirituality. Well, 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 well how, do I, how, do, how do I do that? Well, you build yourself up or you edify yourself or you strengthen yourself, not by coming to church. You see, here's what we do. We substitute the church for Christ. We think that if we have a relationship with the church, it's the same as having a relationship with Christ. So we come here every Sunday and we listen to the praise team sing about Christ and we listen to the pastor talk about Jesus. But that is not a relationship with God. It's a relationship with the church. You need a relationship with the church. That is, you need a relationship with other people who are pursuing God. But if you sit in a crowd of people who are just coming to church, 80% of us forget what the preacher said two hours after the message according to surveys. The real deal is not that you hear someone preaching from his head to your head. The real deal is that you take it to prayer and you say, God, is what he said true? Is that really a word for me? And you pray yourself into spiritual renewal. You can't get preached into a deeper spiritual life. You can only pray yourself into a deeper spiritual life. It isn't horizontal engagement. It's vertical engagement with God. It's not that the preacher had an encounter with God and he comes and tells you what he experienced. It's that that moves you to have your own encounter with God and God begins to talk to you. This is why John would say to us, you don't need that a man would teach you, the Holy Spirit would teach you. Now, he's not preaching against pastors or teachers. What he's telling us is this, that the ultimate teaching is when the Spirit of God leaps in your soul and says, that's right. The ultimate teaching is not when you recognize the voice of a pastor or preacher, but when you begin to recognize the voice of God for yourself and you know this is God talking to me and calling me to change. So Jude said you got you to gotta take responsibility for your own soul health. You got to build yourself up on your most holy faith. Well, how do I, how do, I do that? By praying in the Holy Spirit. The way you strengthen yourself is you pray yourself to new levels of strength and new levels of vitality. Now, there is an anointing to pray. As surely as there is an anointing to preach and an anointing to sing, there is an anointing to pray. 
You struggle to pray. You struggle to shut the doors that are opening and closing. You struggle. The telephone goes off. There's all kind of distractions. Once you get past those distractions and you begin to engage God and you shut everything else out, the Holy Spirit will help you pray. You, there is an anointing that will take you to a completely different level in prayer than you have ever known. You pray in or with the enabling of the Holy Spirit. And when you do that, you build yourself up, you strengthen yourself up in your most holy faith. The third thing that Jude says is that you keep yourself in the love of God. You center yourself while you're praying in the love of God. Most of us have been taught, if we've been around Pentecostal circles or evangelical circles, that we partner prayer and faith. Without faith, we're not going to please God. If we don't have faith, we're not going to get anywhere in our prayer life. How many of you have been taught that? And so you go to prayer and you say, I got to believe, I got to believe, I got to believe, and you're just pumping faith up, right? Memorizing scripture and pumping faith up. I, I've come to the conclusion that's the wrong formula. I've come to the conclusion that you rarely have a faith problem or when you do have a faith problem in prayer, it's not a faith problem at all. It's a, it's a, it's a love problem. The Bible actually says faith works by love. So you center yourself in the love of God. You push back all the God help me prayers. How many of you pray, God help me? Help me with this. Help me get money. Help me pay the rent. Help me, help me. Help. You push back all the God use me prayers and you, and, and you refuse to pray them. And you just settle down and you pray this simple prayer. God, I know that you love me. Pray it with me. God, I know that you love me. Pray it with me again. God, I know that you love me. Pray with me again. God, I know that you love me. You don't start with your love. You don't start by telling God that you love him. You don't start by telling God uh, that you love him in order that he might love you. You don't love God into loving you. He commends his love towards us in that while we are yet what? sinners, he died for us. He loves you when you're spiritual. He loves you when you're carnal. He loves you when you're having a good day and he loves you when you're having a bad day. He loves you when you're acting like Jesus and he loves you when you're acting like, well, you fill in the blank. He loves you all the time until you settle the fact that he loves you unconditionally. You'll never get anywhere with your prayer life. And here's why. You can never pray effectively to a God whose love for you, you doubt. If you doubt that he loves you, then here's what you're doing. You're trying to get the pastor to pray for you. You're trying to get him to pray for you. You're trying to get somebody else to pray for you because God loves them more than he loves you and he'll hear their prayer instead of your prayer. But when you are absolutely convinced that he loves you, little old you, mean-spirited you, he loves me, faith soars. You see, if I believe he loves me, I know he'll help me. I know he'll use me. I know he'll hear me. I know he'll answer me. You don't have a faith problem. You've got a love problem. So what do you do? You center yourself in the love of God. You pray in the Holy Spirit. You keep praying until the Spirit of God begins to help you pray. And then you find yourself getting stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. Now I'm going to mess you up. If I were to ask you, and some of you were with me yesterday when I asked this question, if I were to ask you, what is the one word that, de that describes God? The one word that characterizes God. The one word that stands out above all others that would say, this is what God is like. What would you say? Don't say it. Don't, don't, don't say it because you're going to be wrong. You're going to use a word that starts with L, aren't you? Uh, that, isn't that right? Yeah, that's right. You're going to say God is love. Yeah, but that's wrong. And see, that's part of the apostasy. 
Because there's not a person in the culture that would not say that God is love. So all of a sudden, we're on the cultural script and we've lost the biblical script. What's the Bible say? Do they cry love, love, love in heaven? They cry what? Holy, holy, holy. You see, if you fashion for yourself a loving God, a nurturing God that is not fundamentally a holy God, then you're never challenged in your faith. You're never challenged with regard to sin. You're never challenged to change. Now, you, if you have a holy God and you expose yourself to that holy God, you're overwhelmed. You're wiped out. I mean, just one look at him and John is on his face. He knocks you off your feet. You can't stand before the holiness of God. That's why you center yourself in the love of God and expose yourself to the holiness of God. It's the love that comforts you. It's the holiness of God that challenges you to be whole, to be what he wants you to be, to rise up and become more than you are, to grow out of your narrowness into the person that God wants you to be. That won't happen if you come here Sunday after Sunday and park yourself on this seat. It'll only happen when you get a cup of coffee, two sweet and lows, uh, half and half, that's the way God likes his. And park a Bible on your lap and say, God, change me. God, transform me. God, make me like Jesus. Oh, God. You stop praying for God to do all this and this and this. And you begin to pray, God, start the change with me. I'm in trouble. I need change in my life. Make me like you. So Jude said, you want to strengthen yourself. Well, how do I do that? Well, I pray in the Holy Ghost. Well, 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 what do you mean by that? Well, you center yourself in the love of God, expose yourself to a holy faith or a faith that its purpose is to make you holy. And then he said, then he said, you look for mercy. You look for the mercy of God unto eternal life. In other words, when I get in the presence of God, I'm praying for his compassion. I'm praying for his mercy. I'm praying for his goodness. I'm praying, Lord, have mercy on me because when I'm exposed to your holiness, all of a sudden I feel terribly unworthy and convicted of my sin. So give me mercy, but not static mercy. The mercy is the context in which I see life, real life eternal life. Mercy gives me the opportunity to grow and change and taste eternal life. That's what God wants. He wants you to, he wants you to know mercy, taste eternal life, center yourself in the love of God, but expose yourself to the holiness of God. Pray with the anointing of the Holy Spirit so you become a strong and vital Christian. Look at the person right in front of you. Just punch them, lean over and punch them and say, I don't need this message this morning. I understood all this already, but I hope you're getting something out of this. I'm willing to sit through it uh, for you. Now, now I want to show you, I want to show you, I want to show you something else here because this is not all about you. I want to show you something else that happens in this passage. He says, now on some, on some have compassion making a distinction on, and on others save with fear pulling them out of the fire. All around you are people who don't have a relationship with God. They're deep into the apostasy. They're deep in the moral free for all the world, free for all of the world, or they've never made a commitment to Christ. And here's what prayer will do. Prayer will not only change you, it'll heighten your discernment for people around you. And you'll be able to say, ah, this one, they're not ready. They're not ready to receive Christ. So what do you do there? I make a distinction with them and I have compassion. I call up greater compassion. Because they're green fruit. They're not ready. They're not ready to make the decision. But there are others, I need to get them today. I need to raid hell. I need to pull them out of the fire. Just pull them right out of hell. I just need to lay hold on them and say, John, you've got to get saved. You, you got to, you, you've got to come to Jesus Christ today. And, and see, what happens is the more you pray in the Spirit, 
the more discernment you have as you go through the day. This one's not ready. This one's ready. This one's open. This one's closed. And what I want to begin to do is make a difference in the lives, not only of my own life, but the lives of other people. And notice how this ends. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and present you faultless before the presence of God with exceeding joy and glory. To God our Savior, the only wise God, be glory and majesty. This is the kind of life I want to live. The life where I don't stumble and I don't uh, falter. Now, are you doing okay? Are you breathing? Why don't we pray like this? What keeps us from praying? The average American prays five minutes a day. Christian prays five, five minutes a day. Circling the parking lot at Walmart, praying for a spot closer to the door. We are not a praying culture. We're an anti-prayer culture. Let me tell you what affects us in a culture of apostasy. Let me tell you the diseases that we have that affect our prayer life. The first disease is worldliness. And I don't mean by worldliness what we have classically meant as worldliness. I don't mean what you wear, what you look like, the movies you choose, the entertainment you choose. Those, that's the fruit of worldliness. Worldliness is being addicted to the mad pace of this world. Worldliness is not being able to turn the music off. Worldliness is not being able to get off the treadmill. Worldliness is the mad, frantic rat race. Worldliness is being so busy that we can't pray, we don't pray, we pray on the run, we multitask with God, which is an insult to God. You wouldn't say to somebody really, really significant, I don't have time to talk to you, sir. You can ride in my pickup truck, I'm on my way to work, and I'll talk to you between the traffic and news reports but that's exactly what we do with God. We don't give him quality time. Intimacy demands privacy. If you cannot slow down, if you cannot stop, if you cannot shut everything else out, then you're struggling with worldliness. The cobwebs of worldliness become chains to us that bind us and keep us from accessing God. And that keeps us from mercy and it keeps us from life and it keeps us from love and it keeps us from grace and it keeps us from all of these things. There's a wonderful story. They made it a movie, The Big Miracle 2012, of three whales trapped in the Arctic Circle. You probably have heard the story. An Eskimo by the name of Roy just off Point Bariff found them. There's a small hole left where the ice had not frozen over and they were taking turns breathing. He, he began to burst the ice open, got a chainsaw, the whole village turned out. You got Greenpeace environmentalists working with oil riggers, quite a sight. And they busted the ice open. They brought, brought these huge blowers in to keep it from freezing over uh, during, during the night. And finally, they commandeered two Russian tankers, and they pulled down a mass of uh, ice that was something like 30, 40 feet high and 400 yards wide. They could have never made a way. And that created a path for the whales to get out to warmer water. The baby, only nine months old, died, sadly didn't make it. What's the deal with whales? We well, see, you see, they, they, they live in one world, but they breathe the air of another. When you got saved, you changed citizenship. You became a citizen of heaven. Your spirit was born again. Instead of being body, soul, and spirit, you actually were turned upside down, or you were supposed to be turned upside down, so that your spirit, soul, and body, you need to breathe the air of heaven. You need to leave this world. You need once a day at least to come up from this world and enter into heaven and hear the music of heaven and receive the breath of heaven. And then you need to pull that energy back down and live in this world. God left you in this world to live in this world, but he wants you to live out of the other world. 
If you live in the world all the time and all you do is catch snatches of air, just trying to barely stay alive spiritually, you'll never thrive as a Christian. Now, maybe that's all you want, but I'm telling you there's more. And I'm telling you the more is not by coming to church more and listening to preachers more. I'm telling you the more that we've been missing is the more of exposing our hearts to God over an open Bible where God begins to talk to you and God begins to breathe in your life and you begin to feel the love of God and you experience the life of God. I'm telling you there's something beyond church that that doesn't leave out church. In fact, it'll make you be even more loyal to church. It's not that we're bad people. It's that we're so doggone busy. You heard about Michael Murray. His wife was working on Mother's Day. He loved her so much. They shared two children. He went to the downtown Boston Hospital, got on the elevator, parked in the underground garage, got on the elevator, went upstairs and gave her a a rose, a, a necklace that said, number one, mom. Gave her a Mother's Day card and kissed her and said, I love you so much. I'm glad that you're the mother of my children. Got on the elevator, went back down, found his car in the parking garage, set little Matthew, three-month-old Matthew, on top of the car in the car seat and buckled his uh, two-year-old sister in the car seat and drove out of the parking garage. Drove through the streets of Boston with the baby, the three-month-old baby, on top of the car. Nobody stopped him. Nobody said anything. Got to the downtown connector, accelerated 40, 45, 50, 55 miles an hour and and heard scraping on top of the car. That's when he looked into the mirror and saw where Matthew normally would be buckled in. It was absolutely blank. No, 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 nothing there. That's when, he, that's when he saw Matthew fly off the back of the car onto the, onto the freeway. It was too late to do anything. The freeway is full of, is full of uh, cars. He, he stopped as fast as he could. He got over to the, to the side to go back and try to pick up his three-month-old son. James Boothby was behind him. He's an antique dealer. He, he said, I thought it was just a big piece of debris. And then he said, I thought it was a baby doll. And then I realized it's a real baby. The arms are going everywhere. He said, I, I was able to, to put my brakes on and, 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 and turn kind of sideways in the lane and divert traffic uh, around me. I got out and I ran up the freeway, right in the middle of the freeway, and, and picked this baby up. And, and then I delivered him to the uh, uh, man, the father, who was coming and running, uh, and running towards me. That, 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 that baby carriage, by the grace of God, hit that freeway at 55 miles an hour and never turned over. It just, that baby just got an e-ticket ride for Disney, you know, just bam, 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 bam. Now, here's what I, I would have left to have been in the room when his wife asked him what the scratches were doing on the baby carriage. Let me ask, do you think, do you think he should be shot? Do you think the baby should be taken away from him? Do you think they should lose both their children for child neglect or something like that? No, 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 no. No, 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 this is a good man. And, and, and he loves his wife and he loves his children, but he's so distracted by the world that he put at risk the very thing he was celebrating. And that's what we're doing by not taking time in the morning. That's what we're doing by not making prayer a priority. That's what we're doing by not getting up a few minutes early, getting a cup of coffee and parking a Bible on our lap and opening the cosmic door on our side as if we're in a hotel with adjoining rooms and we say, God, I want you in my life. Here's what the Bible says. The God who sees you praying in secret will reward you openly. That is, if you want to have brushes with God, ambushes by the presence of God during the day, you hide away in the morning and open the door on your side and you say to God, you say, well, I wouldn't even know how to pray for five minutes. Just get a Bible, read it and pray it. Just get a Bible, park it on your lap and say, God, I want you in my life more than anything else. I really want you in my life and I don't even know how to tell you that. And God will begin to help you. Prayer is not words. No, no, no. Prayer is something deep inside of you, crying out for something deep inside of God. You've got to break free 
free of the world. It's mad pace. You've got to escape this world. You've got to shut everything else out and get alone with God. Here's the second enemy of prayer. It's pragmatism. Pragma is from the word, or, or pragmatism is from the word pragma. It means business. And see, here's what happens in prayer. People say, well, I don't pray because I don't get anything out of it. Oh, really? See, you've made it pragmatic. And if you make your marriage pragmatic, if you make your marriage or any other relationship about what you get out of it, you ruin it. You absolutely destroy it because it introduces an ulterior motive. And ulterior motives are always about things in our own heart that render control issues. And that turns the relationship upside down. Instead of putting God in charge of the relationship, I'm in charge of the relationship. And it's all about what I get out of the relationship. What you want is a love relationship, and that's what we're missing. It's an unconditional relationship with God where I come to him and say, I haven't come to ask you for anything. I haven't come to get an outcome. Here's the deal in prayer. There are outcomes for prayer, but you can't always trace the hand of God because if you got what you were asking for, you're not smart enough to tell God how to fix your life or run your life. You see, what God often does is he says no to what I'm asking for, and then he gives me something that I wasn't even asking for, and I didn't even know how to ask for it. You see, you can't make your relationship with God a pragmatic business relationship. I'll never forget a pat being a young pastor. I was praying. I was weeping. I was on all fours. I was praying for my people, the people that I cared about and loved. loved. And I got up from that prayer experience and I turned the office door and I started to leave. And the Lord spoke to me and said, are you finished? And I said, yes. And he said, while I'm running all these errands for you today, what is it that you plan to be doing? And, and, and then I realized that what I was doing in prayer was assigning God things to do. I was giving God a to-do list. And then the Lord spoke to me and said something that broke my heart. He said, Doug, I love your passion. I love, your, I love all the things that you do for me. You preach, you teach. I love all that. But I want more than a business relationship with you. I want a love relationship with you. A few years ago, Barbara and I, we have five kids. We have 18 grandchildren. And we had almost all of them at a cabin in Gatlinburg. You've probably done that. And the big glass windows, and I'm sitting there in the front room, and one of my grandchildren can't, comes and snuggles right next to me. And, and she just sits there, and I, say, I said to her, I said, what, what, do you, what, do you, what, what do you what do you want? What do you need? Nothing, Grandpa. Nothing? No, I just want to be next to you. She's the smartest uh, grandchild that I have. I just want to be next to you, Grandpa. And we sat there for a while in silence. And then we talked for a little while. And then I reached into my pocket and I pulled out some change and gave it to her. It was a terrible mistake. Well, it was good. In one sense, she became an evangelist. She ran through the house saying, look what Grandpa gave you. Look what Grandpa gave you. Look what Grandpa gave you. And, 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 and it was bad in the sense that it broke up our, our relationship. Now, though, I have children around me, grandchildren around me. They're behind me. They're in front of me. They're on my lap. They're... They're rubbing my head. They're telling me that they love me. I'm, they think I'm dumber than I am. I knew she was there for me. They were there for what I gave her. If your prayer life is only to seek the hand of God and not to seek the face of God, it's far too shallow. And what you're missing is this love relationship with him that can absolutely change and transform your whole life. See, God is inviting you. The, the, the deal is, God wants to talk to you more than you want to talk to him. Do you, you know the first thing God says to man in the Bible? It isn't man that talks to God. It's God that talks to man. Do you know what he does? He blesses. Be fruitful, multiply, fill up the earth. I give you the gift of dominion. I empower you. See, what blessing are you missing? Because you see, a blessing is not a blessing until it's pronounced. And you don't get a blessing in a group like this. You get a little bit of a blessing. But the blessing that God has for you 
is the blessing that he wants to speak over you as your father. He wants to lay hands on you and call you by name and speak an empowering, love-based, transforming blessing over you. But it'll never happen until you give yourself to time alone with him. The last enemy is narcissism. I don't need to mention it. You, you know, narcissist, he fell in love with his own uh, reflection in a pool. So, so here's what you hear in religion all the time. Here's what you hear in Christianity all the time. This is the way to self-actualize yourself. This is the way to improve yourself. This is the way to grow yourself to your potential. Boom, 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 boom. Really, it's religion turned upside down. It's not a call for sacrifice. It's a call for fulfillment. It's not a call to serve God. It's a call for God to serve us. Does God want to bless us? Yes. Does God want to fulfill us? Yes. All of that is true. But you don't begin that way. You begin by surrendering to him, by having more than a pragmatic relationship with him. You have a love relationship, and you can't wait to get alone. So you push off the worldliness and the mad pace and the craziness, and you escape this world, and you climb up into the world on top of this world, and you sit in the lap of the Father until you begin to hear his voice for yourself. And he wants to talk to you. My sheep hear my voice. You forget what, what's her name on the talk show? Who says it's crazy to hear from God? Joy, Bihar. Forget what she says. God talks to his people. I, I, I'm finished with my introduction. From today to Pentecost Sunday is 56 days. It takes you about 70 days to instill a new habit. Now, it takes you much less days if you've had plastic surgery um, to get used to your new face. But it takes you a little over two months doing something almost every day until something flips. And if you don't do it, you miss doing it. 70 days. So from now to Pentecost Sunday, 66 days. Here's what I want to ask you to do. 15 minutes, the psychologists say, 15 minutes will begin to recalibrate. 15 minutes actually starts rewiring your brain. Do you know that? 15 minutes settles you down. 15 minutes starts deep psychological and psychosocial change inside of you. 15 minutes. Turn everything else off. 15 minutes. Park a Bible on your lap. If you don't have a Bible, go down to the local Bible bookstore and steal one. In fact, they got a Bible bookstore right here in your church. And you'll read where it says, thou shalt not, and you'll pay for it. You'll go back and say, I was wrong. I shouldn't have done that. Start in the Psalms because that's a good place to do this. I want you to read a bite-sized Psalm. I want you to read it a couple of times. If you've got a phone app, You've got several versions there. So what am I asking you to do? Spend 15 minutes with an open Bible and do what? Read a psalm. Then I'm asking you to do the second thing. I'm asking you to reflect or think about what you've read. What are the big ideas? What's repeated? What's being said here? What's leaping off the page? What's capturing my attention? What's the bottom line here? What's God saying? What is God saying to me? This is a logos word, but what's the rhema out of this? I want you to go back and forth in it. Now, you're not doing a Bible study. You're just paying attention. 
So what have I asked you to do? I've asked you to do what? Help me out here. Otherwise, the ushers will lock the doors and you won't be able to leave. And the Baptists will eat all the food on the buffet and you will be in trouble. I'm asking you to do what now? 15 minutes and do what? Read. Read a psalm. Begin with the psalm. And I'm asking you, number two, to do what? Reflect on it. And then the third thing I'm asking you to do is I'm asking you to reason the psalm out in prayer. And I want you to do this out loud. Now, you can do it in whispered tones, but here's what praying out loud does. It forces you to give language to scattered thoughts. It forces you to organize scattered thoughts. Our God is not merely a thinking God. He is a speaking God. And there's life in word and there's something that happens when you hear yourself praying. So I want you to wrestle with this. Lord, I don't lie down in green pastures very well. I don't follow you. I know I get ahead of you sometime. I, 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 uh, I let fear overwhelm me sometimes. I just want you to pray it out to him. God, I want you to be my shepherd. I, I, I want to trust you. I want to know you in a way I've never known you. I really do, God. Just tell him that. I'm old, help me out here. And then take me back to the home in a few minutes. But number one, what I'm asking you to do? Read a psalm a couple of times and reflect and then wrestle with it. Pray it. Pray it back to God. Pray its big ideas back to God. And then I want you, then I want you to just rest for at least a minute or more. Complete silence. I want you to listen for what God might say. I want you to tell him all day long I'm going to have my radio on. All day long I'm going to be listening to your voice. All day long I want you to talk to me. God, I want to know you. I want to know you. Like I think the preacher knows you. No, that's not good enough. Like I think the preacher's wife knows you. I want to know you that good. <laughs> I want to know you, Lord. And then the fifth thing, walk in that. Ask God for the strength to walk. I'll tell you what will happen. If you get the scriptures in your head, here's what will happen. You'll, you'll, you'll feel them picking you up during the day. I'm telling you, you'll, feel, you'll be strengthened. This is exactly what Jude said. You pray in the Holy Spirit and it'll strengthen you. You'll feel the love of God throughout the day. And even when you make a mistake, you'll sense the mercy of God. And you'll say, God, I'm sorry. I know that may affect my life growth here because where I'm really going is, is, is I'm going to life. Read it. Help me out. Reflect on it. Wrestle with it. Pray it back to God. And then just rest. Go silent. And then walk in it. Become it. Stand.